for initiative. Hello, this is DM Jason, and I'm by myself here at the Roll for Initiative headquarters at our undisclosed location in a cavern deep in the earth beneath a small white house with a boarded up front door in the middle of a field somewhere. The gang and I have taken the week off with this long week with Passover and Easter and the release of the iPad, but to bring you an issue of Roll for Initiative this week, I've snuck into DM Vince's study and gone into the trunk where he keeps the scrolls with the missives of the cleric Thane, and this week we'll bring you a compilation of all the episodes of Thane so far, along with a new episode for this week. Of course, if you are listening to the show on an enhanced stream, you'll be able to see some chapters, so you can go ahead and skip ahead to the new episode if you're already caught up, or listen all the way through if you like. We'll be back next week with an all-new issue of Roll for Initiative, so until then, enjoy the show, and keep it original. My eyes are open wide, but all I see is blackness. My lungs are full of water. I am not dead. Not yet. Heronius, relieve me of my fear. And in death, may I serve your ends, as I have tried so feebly in this life. I have had this dream every night since the shipwreck, yet it always ends with my soul twice delivered. For one, I was not afraid. I felt close to him, and death held no strangeness or terror. Did he show me his favor in this comfort, in what by all rights ought to have been my final moment? I was ready, but I did not die. The second deliverance. A strong hand pulled me onto the raft, no more than a piece of the wreck of the ship that would have borne us to our quest. Athanasius, never has the face of a friend and mentor been so welcome as when you drew me from the blackness. To follow you and serve Heronius as you did was my only ambition. Your prayers were not only sweet in the ear of Heronius, they were a guide to me. Sometimes, when I wanted for inspiration, or fortification from fear, or discipline in the face of my own lesser nature, I would imagine the difficult, honorable path as advice, given by your voice, and it gave me the strength to do the will of our God. Athanasius, the light of Heronius was so strong in you, and now, snuffed out. In my prayers, I will never fail to mention your name. Now I wear your bolt of silver around my neck, and will raise it and proclaim the power of Heronius. For I shall not abandon it, or our quest. Why else have I been spared your fate, and the fate of all who sailed with us? If I die in this quest, dare I beg your intercession with our God, that I lived to do his will, by following your most excellent example. And if I live, I will declare you Saint Athanasius of the God Heronius, and dedicate a temple in the land in which you were martyred, when it is freed by a most deserved crusade from the orcs, goblins, and trolls who infest it. For the shore on which we washed up was that of the Pomarge. Its people, 
those who remain are slaves to the foul creatures that teem in its wastes. No man, elf or dwarf, would set foot willingly in that cursed land. Five of us had found each other, survivors of the wreck, and made our desperate flight to the northwest. And I had hope that we could yet carry forth our mission, in spite of our terrible misfortune at sea. Besides Athanasius and myself, there was a young wizard and two crusaders, all of whom had been part of our quest from the beginning. On our doomed ship, the rest were scribes en route to the city of Greyhawk, some commoners, and others unknown to me. I do not see how any of them could have survived. In fact, I am quite sure I am the last. We were correct in believing we were not far from the borders of the wild lands where the foul creatures of the Palmarge fear to wander. We thought by a forced march we could escape. But the smell of the flesh of men in the Palmarge roused a hunting party of orcs. The others knew I could not match them in battle. And though they did not mean to die to protect me, before they turned to face the orcs, they passed to me their correspondence, maps, and a few personal effects, such that I knew without any discussion that I was to survive them if the battle went ill. Orcs are most fearful of magic, and their crude arrows slew the wizard in the first moments of battle. The others were overtaken, three orcs to a man, and cut down, or caught in their nets, dragged off to a fate far worse. I was well hidden, and though the orcs thought they'd finished us, some searched out the area, as close as they were willing to venture to a border that I know is more weakly guarded than they believe it to be. One of them came upon me in my hiding place, and the power of Heronius protected me. I issued the command in the orcish tongue, free, free, free. and this weak-willed beast obeyed a god so much greater than his own. But in minutes, a new hunting party was raised. I'm fortunate to be much more fleet of foot than I am skilled with a mace. Those whom my friends could not defeat, I could outrun. And so, I am encamped alone in a wild land. There is no ship to bear me to safety, and nowhere to go but onward. I still have a quest. I will attain it or die, and death holds no fear for me now. The morning was gray but warm. There were no towns known for many miles to the north. The unsettled coast promises no safety without weeks of travel. To the west, this land is bordered by the Sus Forest, where elves are known to live. Orcs and goblins earned their hatred long before the arrival of men. I decide to head west until I have the forest in view, and only then turn north toward the object of my quest. For three days I traverse an empty land. I move as fast as I can without exhausting myself. At times, I felt myself followed, yet I saw no one. I lit no fire so that my passage would likely go unnoticed. This land, with care, could be fertile, and here and there I saw evidence that it was once cultivated. A ruined wall here, denoting an old farm now overgrown, or a dwelling abandoned for what looked like a century or more. A faint air of tragedy hovered over the landscape. On the fourth day, my luck changed. The thin wood that had slowly enveloped the country opened up. The land sloped gently down toward a broad stream. In its crook was a farmhouse. I decided to approach. As I passed the fields, I saw that though they were fertile and productive, those closest to the wood were overgrown with weeds. It seemed this farm was wanting for labor. The fields closest to the house were still tended. I stopped at a polite distance and hailed. At length, a young man poked his head out the window. He said nothing, but stared at me grimly, and I let him hold me in his gaze. He asked if the lords had sent me, and whether I had word of his sister's fate. I told him I was from far away, and sought shelter and provision, and knew nothing of this land or its lords, but I could see he felt I was honest. He came to the door and invited me to sit with him. 
By his movement, I could see he had recently suffered a wound. He told me his name, Deneb. He was perhaps twenty. He soon warmed to me, and seemed well pleased to have a guest from afar. I saw on his mantle a wood carving with a red drop of blood depicted. It cast a foul presence over the room, and I knew it to be a holy symbol. I asked after it, and he said it was the sign of his lords and their god. He was bitter towards his lords. And although this is a common complaint amongst the peasantry in many lands, I inquired after them. I said I would expect that on the frontier he should have some sort of protection. He poured a draft for us both, and looked at me with eyes weary for one so young. I asked him, with some presumption, where are the clerics? Where is the local militia? So he explained. In the time of his grandparents, the land had been prosperous and secure. But the orcs from the south pressed them, and the lords, through some dark art, had lost the trust of the elves, on whom these men relied. In desperation, the lords had made common cause with some renegade goblins. They tolerated their settlement in the hills to the west. By rousing the goblins against the orcs from the south, the lords were able to hold on to their land, but the lot of the peasantry turned grim. The goblins were cruel. The lords discouraged the use of arms among men, so they could grow food for the goblins. Now and then, people disappeared, and the goblins were blamed. Soon, the remains of the militia could only do their best to keep the goblins at bay. Yet the lords still took the fruit of their labors and turned it over to the goblins. No one knew if the orcs to the south were still a threat. The lords seemed satisfied to have both men and goblins at their service. It was rumored that in their towers the lords practiced evil rites to sanctify the blood that was spilled between goblins and men. Deneb's father had been in the militia, but both his father and mother had died of plague some years ago. I knew there was no need to ask after the local clerics and why they did not stop the plague. Deneb's story was not finished, but he lapsed into a silence that felt like a spell was cast on us. He had not spoken again of his sister, but it was clear to me she had been taken recently, and no help was expected from the lords. The sun was setting, and darkness was creeping into the window. I turned to the fireplace and mantle, and I remembered at last what I had learned early in my education at the Temple of Heronius. The meaning of the blood symbol came to me. It was that of Erethnol the Many. The war between men and goblins was his holy work, and their suffering his power. The presence of the blood symbol in the room revolted me. Deneb saw that I was looking at it. I felt the fear he had been living under, and put my hand to my chest and Athanasius' bolt of silver. Our eyes met again. He shuffled to a chest and drew from it a weapon, the short sword that his father had from his time in the militia in the waning days of the safety of men in these lands. The air was thick with Deneb's bitterness. I rose and put my hand on his shoulder. You fought them, I asked, when they took your sister? You were wounded. He nodded and began to cry. I called forth the power of Heronius to heal him of his wound. He looked at me in awe. This, I said to him, is what you are owed by your lords, not the fear you have been living under for so long. I pulled the blood symbol of Arithnal from the wall and threw it on the stone floor. Deneb's eyes were full of fear. I knew he had dreamed of doing this. If the lords returned and saw their symbol defiled, his punishment would be severe. But through his fear I also felt a righteous hatred. I drew my flail and smashed the blood symbol. He rushed forth and fell to his knees at my feet, and picked up a few of the shards, trembling. I knelt next to him, and drew forth the silver bolt of Heronius. I opened his hands, and he willingly dropped the shards and took up the silver bolt. I threw the shards of the blood symbol into the fire. For a time, we both kneeled there as in prayer. Deneb's father's sword lay before us. I picked it up by the blade. The heat of the fire had warmed it to the touch. He passed the silver bolt back to me and took hold the hilt of the sword. Will you help me avenge my sister against the goblins, he asked. I told him my god, one that would watch over us with blessings and give us strength in battle, would have it no other way. I was able to sleep deeply, the first time since I set out from home many weeks ago. In the morning, Deneb and I ate as much as we could. It would be a long time before we could eat our fill again. 
If we survived the goblins and made the road north to my quest, we would soon be tightening our belts. Deneb had lived his whole life in this place, in misery, and now that everyone who made it bearable was dead and the end was upon him, he was impatient to be gone. It was midday, and we were near ready to depart, when a hail was heard outside. Deneb turned to me with contempt in his eyes, and I knew he believed the lords of the land had come to call. If it were true, there was to be a reckoning before we left for the goblin caves. If he challenged followers of Erethnol, I would stand with him. Deneb stepped outside, but in moments had returned looking well pleased, and bid me to attend a visitor. I followed him outside and saw a woman, wiry, road-weary, but still armed with what appeared to be orc loot. She all but fell at my feet and asked if I remembered her from the ship. She had been tracking me and had not eaten in four days and asked for food. I could see the beginnings of desperation in her plea. She was not starving, but a few more days in the wild and she would be. Her name was Deirdre. She told me she had survived the palm arch and dispensed with two orcs that had tried to ensnare her. She found evidence of my recent passing and had been given hope that someone else from the ship had survived, and she made haste to catch up. Between words, she ate ravenously and seemed to recover some strength from it. She must have been losing ground on me the whole way. She was smaller than me and would make poorer time. Had there been rain, she would surely have lost my trail. Deirdre was en route to Elred, to serve in the court of a trading family whose younger son had pretenses to nobility. Her intended employer meant to seize an unsettled area inland from the city, clear it of threats to settlement, and claim lordship. I asked her in what capacity would she serve, and she straightened her back, cocked her head in a motion clearly rehearsed for a skeptical audience, and put her hand to the axe that hung awkwardly at her side. Woman at arms. I did not doubt it. The filthy armor she wore and the axe were of orcish manufacture. Although she was small, she had a directness about her physical presence that suggested some martial training. I could see, behind her obligation and our kindness, was a keen resourcefulness by which she survived shipwreck and dispatched with two orcs who meant to take her captive. I explained to her our situation, the ends at which Deneb had found himself, and the depravity of the local nobility. She had no desire to wait around for predatory goblins, or an arrogant lord who would at best treat her as he had Deneb's family. Deirdre said to me, Now that I am with you, I feel safer than I have since I left home, and I do not wish to be parted. I will go with you against the goblins. Deneb and I were both glad. Until this moment, I doubted Deneb and I would even survive. We stayed another day in the house with Deirdre to allow her to rest. She spent some time cleaning and trimming the orc armor, and soon it looked as if it had been made for her. The next morning, we set out. Deneb led us south along the east bank of the stream. About a mile on, there was a bridge. On the western shore, the path forked, north to the manor house of the noble of the march, and southwest to the hill country and the goblin caves. Along the road, the overgrown farms gave way to wilderness. The road faded to a footpath. Deirdre walked ahead with Deneb and asked him about his experience with drill or battle, of which he had only foggy notions that were likely to get him quickly run through. She had a stop several times to practice with Deneb and periodically flashed a sly glance to me, amused but also pleading. It would take some cooperation on both our part to keep this farm boy alive. Hills gradually folded up around the horizon, and we found ourselves in a rugged area after midday. Trees on either side of the path had markings meant to serve as a warning. Again, the blood symbol of Erethnol, and also other goblin signs. I quieted Deirdre and Deneb, and we began to explore the area, looking for a cave, which I soon spotted. I'm breathing. 
on dry land at last. My body is intact, no broken bones. My sword is gone, my gold is gone, but I still have the knife and the vials. I feel them pressed safely against my side. The seals are intact, all of them. Good, very good. I dry the knife, still sharp. I talk with some of them on that creaky death trap the Groton, drag up the gear in that sea. No temple, no service to the idiot peasantry. No crusades, I'll fight for my own gain, thank you. No slavish devotion to an indifferent god. Lady at arms, piff. They believe that? Like anyone would take a job in Elred. A lone woman in that hellhole could hope, at best, to be a harem slave. Speaking of slave, that is what I'll be if I don't get the hell out of the Pomarge. I thought we passed this coast. It won't be far to the frontier. I can see plainly where they made ground. A small group, maybe a mile up the beach. It has to be them. They are steadfast, or maybe their god helped them through the shipwreck. I have to wonder if I will be safe or alone, or if I join them. Besides me and the crusaders, I hope everyone else drowned. They are better off that way than being found by the orcs. I decide to track the crusaders. No need to be caught by a hunting party. Let them draw all the attention. I think Lost Slave is the role I'll play until I get out of Orkland. That will get me close without getting shot full of arrows. The trail is easy to follow, and I head after them. It is late in the day. In the distance, two figures are moving toward me. Orcs. I hunch and shuffle and try to look fearful, while I saturate the blade of the knife from a vial. They run towards me, shouting. What a horrid language the orcs have. Slave stop, slave kneel. I think they only know as much orcish as I do, and it's their only language. If orcs weren't so strong, they'd be funny. I obey, and as they approach, I mutter, Bad man kill master. Help me. Don't hurt me. A whole stream of slavish babble that might convince them that I am as I appear. A wretched, harmless girl. A pay farm slave. Or, ugh, I don't want to think about what they do to me. If one of them turns back to report, I'm going to have to catch him, or I'll have a small army after me. They fall for it. The small one produces a rope he means to tie around my neck. The other stands back with his axe. Gods, they are hideous. Perhaps the crusaders have a point. Rope or clumbers behind me. Just when he extends his arms to lower the noose, I wheel around and slash at him with the blade. A beautiful wound opens up on one of his forearms. I bet he thinks he's going to punish me horribly for that. I wheel around and the other one is on me. He still doesn't get it. He's trying to subdue me with the flat of his axe. Greedy monster. He wants a slave of his own. I stab into his midsection but barely connect. The wound is not deep. I back away from both of them. They don't understand what is happening. They think they are going to torture me, but after they have a nap. You orcs are lazy, but this is no time to fall down on the job. I'm right here with the knife, you know. Roborok's eyes are already hooded. He drops his knees, but his arms are still outstretched with the rope in his hands. Forgot what you were doing, have you, you stupid thing? Axe Orc is staggering toward me. But the urge to sleep is overwhelming him. I amble up to him and take his axe out of his hands. He seems thankful to be rid of it as he collapses. Gods, did they store like beasts. This will only last a few minutes. Comes on strong, fades fast. I scan the horizon. No one around. I go through their packs quickly. Orc rations, no thanks. A knife, mine's much better. Nothing useful. They must be low in the packing order. Roborok has some crude leather armor, and he's close to my size. It smells awful. Perfect. That ought to cover up my enchanting scent. What to do? If these two are discovered, I'll have a dozen more after me, and soon regret not drowning at sea. There's nowhere decent to hide the bodies. Ah, I have an idea. I whack the big fellow with the axe about the same place my knife cut into him. No one will find that little wound now. He's bleeding profusely from the abdomen. Finished. Sorry, pal. Maybe they have slaves in Orkel, though. 
Oh, lucky Ropor, you get to live, but not to tell anyone about me. I pry open his mouth with the knife. Risky. Best to let him have a few more drops from the vial. Place a stone between his teeth and cut out his tongue. There'll be no explaining yourself, Ropor. They're gonna punish you. Orcs always assume the worst. I quickly get on my way to the northwest. I think I'll be at the frontier soon. I come across a field of battle. It looks like things might have gone ill for my friends, so I find one set of tracks heading away from the battle. Perhaps there was a coward among them, or they had something they did not want to fall into the hands of the orcs. I have little hope at the moment of fulfilling my mission, but I have nothing better to do now, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. Besides, I am getting bored. I could use some non-orcish company, even a crusader. Roll for initiative.